thank you so much for coming back in slowly. Um, bring your coffees and your breakfast. Um, so from this first session, um, the idea was to, to kind of start building. And so we've, we've understood some of the trajectories of learning, how you start embedding geodata into evaluation, then more specifically, um, how do you start making decisions about whether you have the conditions in place, and then very importantly, trying to understand um, what can we measure and how can we embed it in our, in our design. Um, so in the next session on the program, we're going to get um, focus our lens a little bit more um, with some uh, actual examples of use cases of geospatial uh, analysis in evaluations that are not necessarily impact evaluations, right? So we, we, we will be focusing on that this afternoon, but this morning we want to, um, to, to really have a, a broader scope. We will, in this session, we will also explore uh, the potential for using not remote sensing data, but other type of images data, um, including photo uh, extractions from pictures um, and, and, and the whole suite that uh, uh, my colleague Virginia Siulu, who is data scientist in uh, the methods team of the independent evaluation group and an expert uh, in uh, geospatial analysis and, and, and all kinds of use cases of images, deep learning, etc. We're very fortunate to have uh, Virginia who has uh, played a really important role in, in, uh, in developing all of these use cases. Um, so she will be our first presenter. And then our second presenter, we're also extremely grateful uh, to her um, uh, because she's up in Manila and it's very late. I don't even know what time it is, but it's very late um, from the Asian Development Bank who will uh, follow with a with a second presentation. Um, so, without further ado, uh, I'm going to give the mic to to Virginia. Um, I think you need to go there also. Oh no, you have the clicker. Clicker works. Yes, progress. <laughs> well, thank you as well for for the introduction. Um, so, I wanted to to motivate my my presentation by by giving you a flavor of how ubiquitous data uh, image data is. So just as a few points of reference, it is estimated that about 1.81 trillion photos are taken globally per year. And this number is expected to actually increase to 2.3 trillion by 2030. These figures refer, of course, uh, only to digital images, but there are a lot of other type of images that from which we can extract information. And these include images that are, ex uh, that are captured outside the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So for example, MRI images and remote sensing images. The uh, last ones are particularly important for uh, geospatial analysis, as you have already seen on some of the previous presentations. And uh, we will see some more examples of that uh, on, on my presentations as well. And connecting as well with the poll that we had earlier, so here you, you have the answer of the actual number of satellites that are currently uh, active and orbiting the, the Earth. And this is a data source that we use a lot in IEG in order to, to complement other data sources in, other, in our evaluations. Um, so on this uh, I wa uh, slide, I wanted to show you some examples of the type of images that we used for geospatial analysis. Uh, so you have uh, first an example of a daylight uh, satellite image. The second is an example of nighttime uh, satellite image. The third example, which is uh, maybe a bit less used than the, the other ones, is a streetscape photo. And this is uh, simply a photo taken with a digital camera or even a smartphone of an urban scene. And with this, we can use uh, different computer vision techniques in order to, to extract information. Uh, these images are uh, typically geolocated. We can map the exact location each image was taken and, and use that to, to map it accordingly. And there's also quite a lot of publicly available images of this type uh, from platforms such as Mapillary or uh, Google Street View. The uh, last two examples uh, show an example of a drone image that you can appreciate the, the higher resolution of the image as drones uh, tend to fly relatively much closer uh, to the, the surface um, 
of analysis. And the last one is an example of a radar image that it doesn't look as similar to the typical color representation of images, but it has the advantage that it's not affected by cloud coverage, which makes it suitable for some specific applications. Um, here in IHG, we have experimented with different techniques for geospatial analysis. And uh, so this includes traditional uh, GIS um, methodologies, uh, remote sensing applications, some photogrammetry, which is mostly used uh, for 3D applications, as well as machine learning and computer vision applications. And the, the, slide, the, the image that you can see on the slide is actually an example of a computer vision algorithm, which is called semantic segmentation. And I will explain a more detailed example of this, but just to give you a very quick understanding, so this is an algorithm that segments an image into different elements. So for example, vegetation is one class, uh, roads is another class, and so forth. And this is something that we have been using in the context of evaluations as well to extract some information from these images. I wanted to uh, move next to, to give you some more specific applications on how we actually use these applications in, in IEG. And we normally think about geospatial applications within this framework of three categories, measurement, relevance, and effectiveness. Uh, the, the first category, uh, measurement, uh, refers mostly to descriptive analysis which uh, we use to, to get a sense of the change across time and across space uh, for, uh, for a specific project. The uh, second is uh, relevance, which refers to the appropriateness of project objectives and measures the extent to which effort fit with the local needs and the strategies of targeted communities. And uh, finally, effectiveness allows us to understand the, text, the extent to which we, uh, the expected specific goals have been reached through the project activities and efforts. So in the next few slides, I will give you an example, a very specific example that we developed here in IHG that fits into each of these uh, three categories. So the first example I wanted to share with you is an example of measurement. And here you will see two different techniques that we actually combined uh, for the same application. And it's using uh, remote sensing data, uh, specifically uh, satellite images, uh, for deriving a time series data of uh, land cover classes. And you will see on the next slide a semantic segmentation application on the same, on the same location. Uh, so in, in this case, so what we wanted to ascertain was the, the change in land use classes for a specific area. The, the challenge that we had when doing this evaluation was that the project was actually quite old. It took, took place several years ago, as you can see from, from the time series. And it was actually a fairly small area uh, that comprised only 45 hectares. So that made it particularly challenging given that the resolution of uh, publicly available satellite images uh, in, in some cases was not sufficient for what we wanted to achieve. Uh, so what we did in this case is we created a time series data of the different land use classes. And so you can see on the, uh, on the first slide that the, the predominant color is yellow, which corresponds to the agricultural class. And uh, the, the evolution of the time series shows clearly how uh, towards the end of this time period, the urbanization, or the, the red color on the slide, uh, greatly increases. And that's actually something that we wanted to, to observe on the ground, because this was a specifically a project that aimed towards uh, increasing uh, the urbanization of this area. So this was a way that allowed us to, to actually understand what, what happened on the ground and to measure this. And uh, beyond the, the mapping and the images that you see online, because the pixel size have very specific dimensions and we know that the size of the area as well, we can uh, be, be very accurate into estimating uh, what percentage of uh, increase or decrease in different, um, in different classes uh, took place during this period. And the way we, we did this was with a combination of different machine learning algorithms uh, that we, for which you need to select specific pixels that correspond to one of the, each of the four classes that we were interested in, in monitoring. And 
uh, use that for training a machine learning model that then can be applied to other images or other segments of the images to predict the corresponding class. Uh, so the, the specific uh, model that we use in this case achieved an accuracy of approximately 85%, uh, which uh, we're, we're very, uh, very confident with uh, the quality of the model that we built. But in addition to uh, this approach, uh, we also, in the same location, use a second methodology, uh, which is uh, semantic segmentation. Uh, so as I mentioned uh, this um, a bit earlier, this is more of a computer vision technique. And the way this, uh, this application works is uh, based on streetscapes uh, photos, uh, which we obtain mostly from a publicly available platform, which is Mapillary. Uh, in order to uh, do this analysis, we first uh, used a grid over the area of analysis to make sure that we have images that cover the different parts of the area of the study. And for some specific cells for which we did not have enough images, we complemented that, but actually working with local consultants that took additional photos uh, for our analysis. Uh, so in, once we have all these data collected, uh, so we had to do some, uh, some selection of the available images uh, because as you can expect, when we're trying to measure uh, some phenomena such as greenness, for example, uh, the way the images look will have a great uh, seasonal effect. So it will be very different what the photo looks like in winter versus what it would look like in, in summer or spring. Uh, so we actually selected a very specific uh, uh, period for the extraction of the images. And we used the metadata of the images using a, a custom Python script to parse all the geospatial data for the images in order to uh, select the appropriate ones for the analysis. From this, we apply, we apply a semantic segmentation technique that I referred to uh, before. And on this, so you can see an example on the slide. So the, the first three images that you can see on the slide are the actual photos, some of the actual photos that we use for the analysis. The second row of images that you can see on the slide are examples of this segmentation algorithm. So you can see that the detail of the images is greatly reduced in the images, but uh, this allows us to classify each pixel as belonging to a certain class. So for example, the sky, is classified in the same color of, of uh, blue, the trees are classified as a vegetation class, which is green on these images, and so forth. And from this, we were able to extract some urban indicators. An example of one of the indicators that we extracted is greenness, and that's what you can see on the, on the map on the slide as well. And I should clarify that this greenness indicator is uh, different from the perspective that you would obtain from a satellite image, which has much more of an overhead view. Uh, while in this case, it captures a much more granular indicator that's more from the perspective of a pedestrian, for example, exploring the city. And it would capture not only the, the parks or the big green areas, but also the trees along the street, private gardens, and so forth. Uh, so um, the map that you see here is a combination of both approaches. Uh, so we extracted calculated greenness using this semantic segmentation approach. And we also complemented the information with whatever we could obtain from the overhead view of satellite images. And we were able to, to obtain a quite precise understanding of how this specific indicator uh, is reflected across time. Uh, the next uh, example that I wanted to share with you is uh, an application of effectiveness, uh, uh, sorry, of relevance. And uh, this is a methodology that we have been piloting in IEG across many of our country program evaluations. And it's a quite customized methodology that relies on, on um, estimating two different aspects. One is the need and the other is the uh, level of access. The uh, level of uh, need is proxied by disaggregating macro variables such as population or GDP per capita, as well as sector specific variables that could target access to basic services, for example. Uh, the other part of the analysis is the level of access, which is proxied by determining the number of World Bank interventions that took place with the same level of geographic disaggregation. 
Uh, so this analysis relies on building a customized data set and the specific data sources used will change based on each, uh, each country and what's available. Uh, but here you can see an example of Mozambique and one of these greedy data sets that we use, uh, which is um, GDP uh, data. So you can see the, the data for two time periods and as it can be very hard to see the difference just by visual inspection of the two maps, the third map that you can see on the screen is the result of applying a change detection algorithm which shows the difference between the, the two. So the areas uh, highlighted in purple is where there was an increase in GDP while the areas highlighted in orange is the areas where we observe a decrease. And this can be mapped in many ways as one example is uh, the maps that you see below on the screen where you can see one layer showing the change in GDP and the second uh, layer which are the, the bubbles on the map show the number of projects from the World Bank that focus on those uh, specific and uh, finally, I wanted to share with you an example of effectiveness. And uh, this is an approach that we very recently piloted in order to understand the land use composition on a very specific area around the bus rapid transit system in uh, Dar es Salaam. And uh, the, the main data source that we use in this case uh, was um, building footprint data, uh, which is a data set created by Microsoft using multiple sources of high resolution satellite images and drones that actually delineate all the, the, the morphology of the parcels uh, for, a, for a global uh, coverage. So in this case, what we did was uh, create a grid as you can see on the, on the slide, that uh, we use as a unit for the analysis. And in one of the alternatives in order to understand the different characteristics of land uses is by uh, considering different uh, shapes of these parcels and the size, for example. So I'm not going to explain all the, the metrics one by one, but here you can see a snapshot of the six metrics that we calculated and the, the intuition, for example, is that informal settlements tend to have smaller shapes and more irregular shapes as opposed to uh, more, more formal settlements. So we, uh, based on the literature, we determined six specific metrics that were of interest. And based on that uh, parcel data that we had, we extracted these characteristics and we map the characteristics of the six metrics on the same grid, which has the same different size that I showed you before. Uh, so combining these six metrics, we were able to cluster the six dimensions by uh, getting a sense of the different composition of these parcels. So that's the, the last image that you see on this slide. And uh, you can see the, the very different type of land use that we, we found on this area. Uh, one disadvantage of this approach is it's an unsupervised approach. So we can see that there are different distinct parcels, but we cannot get a specific name for those. So we had to work with consultants and urban experts in order to help us identify what these type of parcels are. And finally, and uh, just to, to close uh, this session, I wanted to just give you a very brief update on the different advantages and disadvantages that we can observe on image data. Uh, so, as we have seen as well on the, on the previous session, one example, uh, one advantage of using image data for evaluations is that it can augment existing data sources, that uh, there is quite an abundant uh, number of, of sources that can be used for this type of analysis, and including for a, a long time period, which allow us to construct uh, different time series uh, to see the evolution of the phenomenon on the ground over time. There are, uh, however, some challenges that are important to consider. Uh, the, the most important one is to construct validity challenges. In an essence, when we're using uh, image data, we're proxying a phenomenon that takes place in the ground. So, for example, we can use the, a photo of a house to get a sense of the poverty level of the neighborhood. 
However, that, that relationship needs to be validated and, and demonstrated in, in a rigorous way in order to, to be robust in the analysis. So the importance of, of ground, ground truth in the image, it's, uh, it's a very important consideration. And um, finally, uh, so as you, uh, we have seen on this uh, slide, image data can, can be very useful to, to complement more traditional data sources such as um, census and survey data. Uh, there is quite a long and established time series data of satellite images specifically, which uh, can be used uh, to, to measure a phenomenon over time. And hopefully these examples have, have you given you a flavor of what can be done with images and how they can be uh, efficiently used for uh, me measuring change over time and space, but also to uh, uh, complement analysis in terms of relevance and effectiveness. And I wanted to finally share some resources that uh, we have uh, compiled here at IHG. And specifically, I wanted to draw your attention to the first one, which is a methods paper series that we uh, recently published on leverage image data for evaluation. So if you're interested to hear a bit more on the first example I presented on semantic segmentation, uh, that explains in a lot more detail uh, there. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer later any questions. Um, an overview of what uh, they've been up to at the Asian Development Bank. Um, and so hopefully the, the magic of WebEx will work. Do we have Maya online? Can we see her presentation and, and her face? Uh, can you see my face? Can you hear me? Yes. I think I'm uh. helping with the presentation. So yeah, I'll just tell her when to go to the next slide. Thank you, uh, Maya. So thank you, Estelle. And uh, very good evening to you all from Manila. As Estelle said, it is in fact quite late. It's a little past 11 p.m. but. It's been so fascinating. I've been listening in to the entire presentation since nine. Uh, so I actually feel I don't have to spend as much time on my slides since a lot of the groundwork has been laid by others who came before me. Uh, so what I'm going to present today is really just a collection of a few examples uh, of the ways in which we have used uh, geospatial data, specifically uh, imagery data. Most of it is satellite images. Uh, there's one example where we use uh, radar. Um, and then uh, there's also, I'd say, a mix of project evaluations and there's one portfolio evaluation at the sector level. So it's a, it's a mix of a few different things. And just uh, by way of disclosure, I'm not a, I'm not a data scientist or a geospatial um, analyst. Uh, I just have a nodding acquaintance with these methods from a classes I took in urban planning about two decades ago. This is way before QGIS was even uh, on the horizon. So that's uh, how old and outdated my, my knowledge is. But I think I know enough to sort of, you know, uh, grasp the basics and explain, explain things uh, to, I'd say, a layperson. Uh, not terribly technical, I'm afraid. Uh, so with that, I'd like Megan to move on to the next slide. So the, I won't spend too much time on this slide, except to say that just like all the other multilateral development banks, um, independent evaluation units, including at IEG, we conduct evaluations at various levels of aggregation. Uh, the lowest level is project, and then moving up all the way to corporate evaluations. So the three types of, the three levels of evaluation from which I've drawn examples today are project level, sector level, and there's one thematic evaluation that's uh, featured uh, very briefly on just one slide. Next slide. Okay, so these are the, uh, these are the five examples I'm gonna walk you through. Uh, the first is a rather unusual use of geospatial data, but it was very useful in this particular instance. Uh, this was for selecting comparison groups for an ex post impact evaluation for a project that was not set up to be evaluated this way, and there was no baseline data collected. Okay, so we'll tell you what we did to get around that issue. Uh, the next two examples are evaluating crop yields and evaluating restoration of wetlands. Uh, that's actually a couple of projects that were featured in a sector-wide evaluation of agriculture, natural resources, and rural development. 
The fourth one, assessing performance of climate-proof roads, uh, that's the one for which we used uh, radar imagery. Um, and I'll talk a, just a little bit about that. The last one is uh, on evaluating economic growth along road transport corridors. And that uses uh, nighttime images, which you've already heard uh, from a couple of the previous speakers. Next slide. Okay, uh, so the first example is uh, how and why we used geospatial data to pick comparison towns for this ex post impact evaluation. Um, so this project was on water supply, um, water supply and sanitation services in several towns, small towns in Nepal, I'd say about 29 of them. And we, of course, as the independent evaluation department came in at the end, and there was a demand for an impact evaluation of this project. Um, there were no comparison towns picked at the time that the project was conceived. Uh, so even if we wanted to do a with without comparison, uh, we really didn't know where to start. Uh, but then we had an idea. We thought, uh, let's go to the local experts, ask them to pick three towns that they could think are comparable to the project town. And we use that information uh, to actually uh, you know, get some information uh, from Landsat images, uh, land, land use, land cover data that Virginia also described in her presentation. Uh, and we use that information to pick to pick um, comparison towns. That's the only way we could think of, uh, especially when you're going back in time at Project Start, this literally was the only data available. So in this, uh, in this on this slide, what you have on the top left is Triuga, which was a treatment town. And the three other towns that one of the local consultants thought would be a good uh, comparison town for this for this particular project town. The one that we ended up picking as a comparison town is the one right below it, uh, Qatari. Uh, really just by visual inspection, we didn't compute anything, uh, we didn't do anything further, but just by looking at this visually, uh, we thought Qatari would be a good fit. So we did that for nine other uh, nine other treatment and treatment comparison town pairs, and that's that's what we used as a basis for our impact evaluation. Um, next slide. Okay. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, this example is uh, from the sector wide evaluation, and this was evaluating crop yields in Bangladesh. Uh, so what this uh, case study really uh, looks into is they, there was a 300 hectare irrigation command area in, in Bangladesh, and there was a sub project that benefited from you know, two sequential projects uh, that were delivered uh, over 15 years. So the projects uh, together uh, provided irrigation uh, investments, and they also introduced high yielding rice, rice varieties. Um, and this was actually co-financed by another organization, IFAD. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. Um, so we use the NDVI, which uh, Kunwar talked about, and I think Varhini also mentioned um, in the context of, uh, of, of Tirana, but that's, that's, a, that's a different measurement she used. But anyway, so that's the one we used. And what you see on the right-hand side in those two maps is the NDVI in 2000 and the NDVI in 2017. Just from looking at these two maps, uh, I'm sure without even computing anything, you can say that there was definitely um, an increase in, in, in the yields in this, in this particular area as a result of these investments. Um, so we looked at it in four time slices, year 2000, 2005, 2010, and 2017. And what you see in the chart is really the increase uh, in the rice yields. Uh, for for boro and for almond, and these were actually measured just pre-harvest, so we'd have you know accurate measurements. Um, and uh, what was interesting about this is uh, we also got some estimates of the increase in yield from the farmers during the focus group discussions that we conducted as part of this evaluation. So. Uh, we were really encouraged because what we found from this really simple analysis mapped very nicely with uh, with what the farmers told us. So it's sort of a cross check, right? So triangulating information from two different sources. Um, so we had a lot more confidence in, in these results because uh, we also got the same same information from a from a different different data source. Next slide. 
Okay, so uh, yeah, so this one is um, the same sector-wide evaluation, but a different project. Um, this one was on wetlands restoration. So this is actually uh, the Chishinghe Nature Reserve is part of the Sanjiang Plains, which you, you may have heard of. It's in the northwest of China. And this Chishinghe Nature, Nature Reserve, I think is a Ramsar site, if I'm not mistaken. And it's actually quite, uh, quite important for biodiversity, specifically for specifically for some uh, species of birds, I believe. Um, and again, for this, you know, we we took four different time slices, uh, you know, land cover data, and looked at wetlands, agriculture, grassland, water bodies, and the top chart actually shows you. It's it's barely visible uh, because of the scale, but really, what we found was that the uh, agri agriculture use had actually uh, it sort of remained stable after 2006, which is when the project was introduced. Um, and uh, what's even more interesting is before we conducted this, uh, this little uh, geospatial analysis, uh, a couple of years earlier, we actually conducted a, a full performance evaluation report for this particular project. And at that time, we didn't have the benefit of this information. So. Uh, because it's such a vast area, uh, I think this, uh, when we repeated it using this geospatial analysis, it actually gave us a much, much better handle on what was going on. Uh, for instance, there's no way we would have known from just going to the field that the core area now is entirely free of agriculture, which is something we found you know, from, just, from just the image, image data. Uh, but the thing that we wouldn't have found even from, uh, from the field visit is, a, a troubling, a troubling finding that there was still some agricultural activity that was happening in the buffer zones. So, which sort of indicates that there's a bit more work that needs to be done to fully restore this wetland and 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 prevent the gains from sort of sliding back. So that's this example. Next slide, please. All right. So this is the one example uh, where we actually used radar data. Um, to assess the resilience of uh, climate-proof roads that were funded by ADB projects um, in the aftermath of Cyclone Amphan um, that hit Bangladesh in May 2020. So what you see here are three time slices. Uh, the first one is on 16th May, that's before the, before the cyclone. 22nd May, literally uh, during the cyclone. And 28th May, uh, the third image is uh, just about a week um, after the cyclone. So what we uh, observed was, you know, of the, of the 32 road segments that were funded by um, ADB projects, um, about 10 of them exhibited some, some amount of flooding right around the time that the cyclone hit. But just about a week later, uh, nine of the 10 recovered. So I think that's some indication that um, the uh, resilience was actually pretty good that the that the um, that the climate proof roads actually did their job and they were back they were they were back and I think fully functional just about a week after the cyclone hit. So that's so this is the one that's uh, an example from a thematic evaluation on ADB support for action on climate change. Next slide. All right, so this is the very last example I'm going to walk you through. And this one uh, evaluates economic growth along road transport corridors in Asia and the Pacific. Um, and this actually assessed, uh, assesses using nighttime luminosity data for 33 ADB supported projects in about 16 countries. Um, and the way we did this was we really couldn't find uh, roads that were comparable uh, to, the, to the project roads. So we sort of segmented it as a before and after. Um, so about three years before the project start and three years after the project was completed. And then we compared the nighttime luminosity. And what we found was that on average, 45% uh, of the growth rate could be attributed to the 33 projects. And uh, if you want, uh, I'd say a deeper look at this one, it's actually quite interesting. Um, and I'm sure you know several others have used this technique. This was published in Transportation Research Record. Uh, I don't recall which year, just a couple of years ago. So that's the, that's the very last example. Next slide. Okay, uh, so key takeaways. So uh, 
we have a wide variety of data types and data sources. Uh, as you saw, you know, we use NASA Landsat data, land cover land use data, we use radar, uh, and then um, I suppose uh, all the other types that um, the previous speakers have highlighted. We haven't used any of those yet. Again, just to reiterate what the previous speakers have said, uh, you, we have consistent and comparable data across vast geographies, uh, which is why for the last example that I showed you, we could actually apply the same, uh, same methodology uh, at, at a supranational level, because you have, you have the data that are consistent and comparable across all these countries. Extensive time series. So uh, for example, for the very first, first one where we had to pick comparison terms, we could go back all the way to 2000, you know, to find uh, land cover, land use data, and actually compare towns and pick comparison towns for our uh, for our impact evaluation. Uh, very cost and time efficient, uh, particularly for uh, remote areas and inaccessible areas and 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 sectors where the project areas are really quite widespread, uh, like in agriculture and perhaps uh, environmental interventions. So. That's a really, uh, I think, good, uh, good, good use of geospatial data, and as as we've seen from these examples, these are useful at all levels of evaluation, right from project to sector, to thematic. And uh, Virginia talked about a really interesting application for country program evaluations. Uh, so when we do have the expertise in house, that's probably something we might we might try to do. Uh, but I'd like to end by saying we see all of these really great advantages. Uh, but yeah, I think this data source has to be used with caution uh, to the extent possible. If this can, if if the findings can be ground truth and uh, you can triangulate uh, the evidence from various sources, I think that gives it gives it more credibility. So that's uh, yeah. So that's sort of where I think I'd, I'd like to end. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me for the last 10, 15 minutes or so. Uh, again, as I said, I'm not an expert. I'm speaking very much as a layperson who's used some of this in, in my own work. Um, so I think, you know, if you ask me really deep technical questions, I'd probably be at a loss. But thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Maya. Well, I mean, this is all about bridging and brokering processes so that, you know, as as communities we need to work together. So you you played a very important role, uh, as as you said, as translating for lay people. Um, so thanks for that. Um, we have we have ample time for questions and maybe revisiting some of the questions that we didn't get to in the previous sessions. Um, like last time, I will give priority to the room. I, I have a few myself. Any anyone wants to get us started with with? Yes, please. I think you just have to press uh, mic on. Like this? And then uh, speak close to it, yes. Okay, great. Um, I'm Alvina, um, economist with the IEG. Uh, so I have a question both for Virginia and for Maya. Um, so Virginia, uh, on the evaluation, on the application in Dar es Salaam with the uh, rapid bus transit system, um, it looked like you know a very ambitious uh, um, assessment combining different types of land uses. Um, um, did you? So first of all, I just would like to understand the um, the kind of the evaluation question. Like, what was the what was the result here of that? Was it the 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 changes in land use induced by the rapid bus transit system? Um, and then I also would like to hear from you how you communicate these types of, like the results that come out of an assessment that is quite complex, where it could be difficult for, for people to understand, like, you know, all these different types of land uses, when you combine different variables, what do you end up actually measuring and, and the results. So some, some guidance from your experience there would be, would be interesting. And for Maya, on the uh, question on the WASH uh, evaluation, the first case that you mentioned on selecting compar per comparison group, um, I'm assuming that the outcome variable of interest was access to water uh, but it, or, and sanitation, a combination of both. So what was it about the land use that was, that was relevant for, for the, the access to, to water uh, outcome variable? Uh, if, it, if this was a, 
um, an extension of the public water network. I could I could imagine that institutional capacity, population size uh, are also um, important variables, especially the, the institutional capacity side. So did you also consider non-spatial variables when you were doing this? And, and just understanding the um, the, the, the specific variables connected to land use that were, that you seem, you, you think were relevant for this, this outcome, um, outcome variable. Um, and then on the resilience to, uh, to roads, I'm also interested there, what was the specific, um, the specific kind of intervention, the specific, uh, um, um, aspect of these roads that had been supported that made you assume that, you know that that the effect of the water, you know, that not the flooding not impacting these roads, um, had been had been a result of the intervention itself. Um, you know, did you compare to roads that were not supported by the project, or did you think about the intervention itself and just you know assuming that these had replaced roads that did not have the specific aspect of resilience? Them. So just interested in, to, in some more details there as well. So th thank you so much. Super interesting. Thank you very much, Alvina. You you make very important points, which are that, you know, we, of course, we need to leverage this, but we shouldn't forget about all of the important design steps and understanding what are we measuring? What is the intervention about? Uh, what do we know about it? Uh, how is the dependent variable th th relevant? Are we proxying it well? So uh, this is music to my ear um, that, that we really need to continue thinking as evaluators as we uh, try to exploit uh, these, these new sources of data. So with that, uh, maybe Virginia, you get us started and, and then I'll turn to Maya. Yes, thank you, Alvina, for, for the question. So in, in terms of your the first part of your, your question, more in terms of uh, what we were trying to, to understand with the analysis on the, on the BRT, so we had some historical data of how the, the land use uh, was before uh, the, the project started. And what we were trying to understand is the spatial transformation that took place within the area surrounded, uh, surrounding the, the BRT. Uh, and, and get a sense of, of how that compared. It wasn't a perfect comparison because we didn't have a map as we were able to produce, but we had different sources from documents, from government officials and so forth that gave us an understanding of what the land use was. And uh, we wanted to, to see specifically uh, how clearly delineated the different land use were or how mixed they were in order to, to be used as an input as well more prospectively uh, into the consideration by this type of uh, transport projects on, on the different implications on land use and on whether that has been taken uh, in consideration when building the, the BRT. Um, so you mentioned as well in terms of uh, communication and how we actually uh, express these findings and, and make them clear, and, and that was certainly an, an important consideration. Uh, one aspect that, uh, so in this case, we, we had, well, the map that you saw on the slide that, that we produced, but an advantage of this approach is that we work with the morphology of the parcels, which is visually, I think, quite uh, quite intuitive to see, and the, the characteristics of what constitute different land uses is very context-specific as well. So, for example, what the slum looks like might not be the same in Dar es Salaam as it could be on other places, so we... Uh, we got some intuition from that as well because when, when calculating these six metrics, we were able to see specifically what the parcels, parcels look like, what the size was, uh, how much it changes in small areas of time. So it gave us some, some better understanding from, from that as well. And uh, the, the other thing that we did in order to make these findings more, more intuitive is uh, have quite detailed discussions both uh, with urban uh, experts and experts specifically on, uh, on, on, on the BRT, including that those that were part of the, of the project. Uh, because as I mentioned with this map, we can see there are different land uses and that they're very distinct from one to the other, but we cannot tell what the name of that land use is. So the, the model will not tell you this is, for example, SLAM or, or this is corporate area. 
So on that, we had to work with uh, experts that would help us validate the fun findings on one side, but also to put names to these categories and to help us understand better what this map actually means. And I think that that conveys a lot of power as well in order to, to be able to tell what the different land uses are in, in reality. Thank you. Maya, over to you. Yeah, so uh, to answer the first question on selection of comparison towns. So yeah, uh, the key things we looked for were urban area, um, elevation, and proximity to the main east-west highway. Though we thought those would be really good indicators uh, you know, to sort of match a project and comparison towns are. Uh, in the absence of you know, any other information, that seemed to be a reasonably good proxy, proxy indicator for selection criteria. And on the second question, uh, let me see which one that was. Yeah, so there was in fact a climate resilient infrastructure improvement project in the coastal zone in Bangladesh, and which included upgrading and climate proofing of about 130 kilometers of rural roads, a bunch of bridges and culverts, and also climate proofing some growth centers and rural markets. So, uh, which is why we thought it was important to see if they actually held up in the face of a, of a pretty severe cyclone. And at least from the you know, quick assessment, just based on the radar images, looked like they did pretty well. You know, nine out of 10, were act nine out of uh, the 32 were actually uh, fine, just about a week after the cyclone. And um, there was also an impact evaluation conducted by IFAD for the same investments. And they found that more reliable access to markets through both the dry and monsoon seasons, uh, that sort of enabled local farmers to, um, to smooth out their income and consumption throughout the year. So that's sort of a complementary piece of um, evidence that we had on the, on, the effect, on the effectiveness of these climate proof roads. Thank you, Maya. Any other questions in the room? Yeah, Sabi, uh, I'm going to Harsh, Sabine, if you don't mind. Harsh, go ahead. Um, I had a <coughs> question for the previous panel. You need to speak really in front of the mic. Oh. Uh, I had a question for the previous panel as well, perhaps, yeah. uh, yeah. so I can go with that. Yeah. And I had a small question for Virginia. Um, so um, well, thanks a lot for all of these presentations, uh, very insightful. Um, so for the, um, sorry. For the previous panel, I had a question around, um, you know, incorporation of um, local context um, uh, into the design of, um, of of these different types of studies or analysis. So, um, something that we learned from uh, Kai's um, um, decision tree was that, you know, the first, one of the important questions is whether um, the intervention that we're trying to understand has a geographic footprint. And um, in most cases, if something has a specific geographic footprint, it would tend to be quite specific to that geographic location. Um, so, and in that, I would uh, assume that um, taking into account the conditions of that specific area would be uh, quite important for the design um, of, of these uh, studies. So, so that's one question of mine that how, how important have you found um, incorporation of country or local context to be in the design, not only in the measurement of these studies. And just a small example of that could be around, um, you know, um, uh, looking at, let's say, uh, rice yields. So to really understand whether, uh, whether uh, we are sort of asking the right questions um, for, for that intervention, you know, not just about um, in that area, how the rice yields change, but also whether um, supporting rice cultivation or trying to improve rice yields in that area was sort of the appropriate um, intervention to begin with. Um, so that's my question, thanks. Um, I'm sorry, Virginia. for, for Vahinia, it was a small question about, um, you mentioned image segmentation and semantic segmentation. So just for the benefit of the audience, um, uh, what, what we mean by, by semantic segmentation. So um, my understanding is that uh, as opposed to plain image segmentation, um, the segments would have a label which is meaningful, but it would be helpful to, to understand. Thank you. Thank you, Harsh. 
Um, yeah, I think on, on, on the issue of context, uh, th this is very important. We, we consider that we're getting some information on context by looking through geospatial lens, by images, etc. But that's definitely not sufficient. So how do we think this through is, is a really good question. Anyone wants to take, take a stab at it? Kai? Here, thank you very much <coughs> for the question. Um, yes, yeah, just said already, I, th I think when we uh, make meaning of our data, like at the beginning, we try to merge many uh, sources that we have. So it could be like the geospatial uh, data, it could be uh, survey data that we use. And uh, usually we also try to, and we will see this later too, um, to um, um, have also qualitative, uh, qualitative data. So have interview data with local farmers. Uh, on the one hand, you could do like use it for ground truthing to really ground truth is like what we see and the satellite image is what we also see on the ground. But also um, to go a step further, our methods um, um, integrated uh, designs, we also uh, sometimes don't want only to see like the causal effects, but also understand why something is happening there. So with interviews that we combine with this, we can also um, see some mechanisms, for example. Kunwar, yeah. To speak in the mic, yeah. Sorry, I have a habit to speak. <laughs> so I think uh, adding local context in any GIs is, is, I think, is the most important aspect. For example, MRAD invested millions of dollars in the western part of Nepal to uh, to farm sugar. Noir, you need to also speak in the sugar cane. Thank you. <laughs> In, in order to minimize soil erosion, river cutting, and many other environmental effects. Now, if we just focus on sugarcane mapping only, then we will overestimate that sugarcane plantation is the driver of uh, the, that uh, reducing soil erosion, river cutting. But if we consider sugar mill in the vicinity and uh, surrounding areas, then that can t tell you totally different story. What it means is that we must consider local local concept uh, context whenever we do any GIs, whether it's uh, um, reforestation, whether uh, diversifying crops, whether it's improving crop varieties. From I think we need to dig in deeper to understand what is happening locally before we start implementing any GIs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you want to take the segmentation question? Yeah, so uh, on your question, Harsh, on semantic segmentation, so essentially this is an algorithm that classify each pixel in an image as belonging to a certain class. Uh, so as, you, as we saw in some of the examples on the Tirana um, case study, so the, the image is converted into a much simpler map uh, where each, for example, all the, all the trees are labeled green, meaning vegetation, all the sky is labeled as, as blue, meaning sky, and so forth. And that's what we can use to extract different uh, different urban indicators in this case. So in, I show the example for greenness, but for example, other indicators that can be extracted are sky view. And that's different from object segmentation, which and the difference relies on, uh, the, in the case of semantic segmentation, what we obtain are classes. So just to keep it simple, one class is vegetation. In the case of object segmentation, each tree will be mapped to a specific instance. So that's, that's um, the key difference between the two, and that has many uses as well. Uh, but in this case, we've been focusing on semantic uh, segmentation. Hopefully that clarifies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any, uh, I think we had Sabine, and then Bahar, and then Maria Lisa. Um, so I wanted more to make a comment. Um, I heard several of you since this morning talk about the complementarity of data sources and uh, also comparing and adding experts and underground evidence and testimonies into this. And I would really encourage you all as evaluators and very quantitatively driven people to consider testimonies from beneficiaries and images with proper consent, obviously, of people who are benefiting from those projects. So when uh, Claire was talking earlier this morning about uh, Senegal and uh, crop yields uh, in uh, the rice uh, sector. I kept thinking about a story that has been uh, publicized by IFC, the International Finance Corporation, on the importance of rice 
uh, agriculture for women in Senegal. And it's a, an extraordinary story about that, how over several, about a couple of decades, a, wo a series of women have been able to cultivate their own plots, etc. And so I think if we can unite both ends of <laughs> at the spectrum, from the quantitative to the qualitative, you really have a far more impact and you can really I mean, raise emotions, also give a voice to the voiceless. We heard this earlier this week during the Future of Evaluation event, uh, because that's the whole point of evaluation, is to have an impact on policy and perhaps giving voice to, to people who benefit from those projects is a way to not only provide the expertise you need on the ground, but also to, to, test, to provide more testimonies. Absolutely. Um, Claire, you wanted to react, it seems. Yeah, for this one and your present uh, comments about this example of Senegal, uh, because actually what I present is just a part of it. It was um, <laughs> the methodological uh, aspect, and uh, and I would say try uh, to develop this tool in common with our clients, which is one of the challenge, but. Uh, this was the first step. Then we did a project evaluation where the results of this um, has been included. Uh, and of course, uh, I mean, the technology is, I mean, we need to start by what do we want to measure? What is the real question depending on the context and depending on what we want to address, if it's something about gender or uh, gender inequality, or if the rice is not the same question from Senegal or Cambio Cambodia. Um, so the point is, uh, we had a qualitative part. Uh, we asked before what was important for um, our client, for AFD, but it's a complete uh, different work. And at the end, yes, the two hands come together. Uh, but sometimes you start by the quantitative or the quantitative and then you complement it because in our experience, um, evaluation, but most geospatial um, impact evaluation, it's not a one shot, like it's a journey. You start by something you have, by the data you have an end, and then you discover that the answer is limited. So on the next generation of project or on another study, uh, you will be able to address other questions that you didn't have the data or the time or the budget uh, on the first round. So our message is it's, evaluation is not a one shot. It should be an interactive process and you, it's a learning process. So it's not about what is in the single evaluation report. And I think it works for project evaluation as well as impact evaluation and just special impact evaluation. Thank you. Bahar, you had a question? Yeah, just quickly build actually on what already Sabine and Claire said, right? The qualitative part and understanding the next step. So I think it's a bit more relevant for the bank as we go from, a, you know, in the scorecards, uh, in our scorecard from 100, over 150 indicators to 22 and the crux of going you know, to smaller set of indicators is actually understanding the impact, right? So, like, uh, like we use here all over again, over and over again, is that we don't want to measure how many people have access to electricity, but really who uses it and how it's being used, right? So, the geospatial tools will play even more, imp you know, greater role. I wonder in IEG and also in other agencies, have we? already thought how to square this drive in the development agencies to understand the impact more than just outputs, like we usually try to understand, and how are we planning on using these tools? Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we'll take Maria Lisa as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think you're good. With the red light, you're on. Oh, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, thanks a lot. Very interesting session. So I have questions that are probably more related to the previous uh, panels. So one is on whether uh, you are aware of a mapping of the use of geospatial in different sectors. So my sense is mostly it's being used for infrastructure, for climate, uh, uh, for agriculture. But is there uh, an analysis that tells us 
uh, how um, much has been used and where. Second, uh, the examples come mostly from uh, projects in the public sector, no? building roads and uh, um, improving agriculture uh, practices. Do we have uh, um, examples of the use of geospatial uh, to assess the impact of uh, private sector projects, so international finance corporation for us, for the, for the World Bank group, but that part of the um, international uh, banks. And then third, is there any estimates on costs and uh, time saved thanks to geospatial? I think this would be a, a useful number to have on hand to advocate for it, or any sense of cost and benefit. It seems to me that it's really transformational, so having some numbers on this would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Lisa. Uh, these are hard questions, but they are really good ones. Um, um, maybe, maybe we go, we go with to Maya on the cost side, for instance. Uh, that's the point you made in your presentation. Um, perhaps you don't have a clear cost estimate benefit analysis, but I'm sure you have a hunch as to what w I mean, how efficient it was, and and why it ended up being such a good use. Yeah, I can uh, speak for the example of the uh, Chin, uh, the Sanjan Plain. You know, the one where we looked at the um, at the at, at the natural resources. Um, so, as I said, we had a full uh, project evaluation uh, done about three years before we actually used geospatial data. And so, uh, right away, I'd say maybe that would have been a cost saving of. Forty, fifty thousand dollars. Um, if we had done what we'd done later, at the time that we actually did the project evaluation, it could have been a much shorter field visit, much more focused, uh, basically using the, I guess, the results or the evidence we already had from the geospatial data, and it could have been, you know, very short, very short, uh, a very short in-person mission. Uh, needn't have been as long as it was uh, the first time be evaluated to the project. So that's just one example. Um, any other reflections on, on, on cost and time saved, maybe? Yes, Virginia, go ahead. Yes, I just wanted to, to add to what, what Maya said, that specifically on, on these uh, cases that, that I mentioned, that so this is all based on publicly available image data. So there was absolutely no cost in purchasing additional uh, images or data sources, and this is most of the applications that we have done here in, uh, in IHG has been using publicly available data, so a medium to high resolution satellite image uh, is publicly available through um, organizations such as the European Space Agency, NASA, and so forth. There could be a cost involved if uh, for some specific application uh, you need to use high resolution satellite image that ne typically needs to be purchased uh, from specialized vendors and that can incur an additional cost. But there's a lot of uh, applications that can be developed using publicly available data as well as publicly available software. So the, the examples that I show are all using publicly available uh, tools such as QGIS and Python, which are uh, freely accessible. So then the cost is the expertise of the data scientist um, primarily and in terms of time, I think, um, I mean, it's a bit of a generic answer, but we get faster, right? So for instance, the first time that we did the relevance analysis for CPEs, you know, we were iterating a lot because we didn't really know how to do it. Um, we had a lot of back and forth with the teams on the data, how to how to organize the data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And now that we've done it four or five times, um, it's it's a well-oiled machine, right? So then it's it's much quicker, um, and uh, and I think you know there is a, of course an innovation cost that we we have to be willing to to pay for, um, and there will be applications that are not particularly meaningful, right? So there is a little bit of a sunk cost as well, um, but uh, but for the most part. It hasn't been an either or for us, you know, it wasn't that we could do this design or we could do geospatial. Um, it was more, we wouldn't be able to do this if we were not looking. So it's a little bit more of like expanding the range of things we can do and the type of questions we can answer. Um, anyone else? Yes, please. 
And then we have a question in the back. Yeah, thank you so much. I think just to complement uh, what you were saying there at the end regarding the question of uh, what's the extent to which geospatial analysis can enhance uh, efficiency uh, on the cost side, time and cost side. Uh, one of the things that uh, we saw at 3IE uh, was that during COVID times, there was a big push for more remote sensing because of the difficulty of being in person. Um, and that also contributed to questions about, well, maybe we don't have to do as much in person on the ground data collection. Uh, and and mo sort of moving away from the point uh, raised earlier about the importance of on the ground contextual information, qualitative information. <clears throat> so we ended up actually seeing some geospatial impact evaluations that were done almost entirely remotely. So existing administrative data set in which the boundaries of a treatment area were defined and then all of the variables used for the analysis derived from remotely sensed data from satellites. And the analysis in some cases said, well, we couldn't really find an impact of that. Uh, but then some other qualitative information came out later that suggests maybe there was spillover. It wasn't clear as to the extent to which the intervention was implemented as planned in that location. And so if that if the emphasis is on speeding things up and saving time and money, then the whole thing could be a waste of time if there's a misunderstanding of, of what actually happened. So I just wanted to really uh, underscore the importance of the, the complementarity as opposed to the emphasis on how much can we save. Thanks, Doug. Um, question in the back, and then we'll go back to your mapping, which is a very important question as like a collective. Do we know in what sectors this is more promising. Go ahead, please, and introduce yourself, if you don't mind. Thanks. Um, good morning, everyone. Good evening. Um, I, my name is Vanina Forger. I work in the Agriculture and Food Global Practice at the World Bank. So I think I'll try to many of you here. I am not in the evaluation part, but I'm an operational. I work with the team, uh, with my team, uh, to implement projects, to design projects, and to also do analytics. And we also do, at the end of project, ICR, so completion report for the non-bank people that at the team level we do our own evaluation of the project and then this is then up to the IG to check the work we do and proof uh, what we've done to make sure that we have well assessed uh, our uh, project. Uh, and I mean, so I'm here today because I, I tremendously believe in the potential that tool, although I will not be here, to improve what we do every day. So I have perhaps um, two essential questions for, for everyone. Uh, the first one is about uh, in itinerary evaluation. So we, do you have examples? Are we mature enough in this tool to be able to guide action? Like when we're restructuring a project midway and perhaps we want to expand into a new area. So can we, so basically, do we have already experience on using geospatial tool to help us do better when we do the project, not monitor after? And my second question is perhaps, um, I, I don't even know if that's a question, maybe a comment, uh, but talking about how we complement field data with geospatial data. I'm currently working in Malawi, and in Malawi, we are just trying to tr improve yields, <laughs> which is a big question, particularly now with the drought and all that. And we, when working with the data to assess one of our projects in the past, I realized how incredibly, terribly awful the field data is in terms of quality. We have error measurements, but we also have a lot of confirmation bias, clearly, with people in the field trying to show that this is working. Like we have had like national input subsidy program and clearly there's been confirmation bias on the, in the field. So much that in 2017, there was a paper published by the Michigan University that compared field data with geospatial data and actually used the geospatial data to show that the field data was not good. So right now, in our project assessment, we're trying, we're wondering if we could use geospatial data to triangulate the field data we have that has a lot of noise. Uh, particularly on maize. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about whether that's uh, still a dream or something we should be doing and just to get some, yeah, perhaps a context to try to see how we could do that. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Anyone wants to come in on either of these uh, questions, comments? 
Yes, please, Rachel. Um, well, maybe I can return to the cost question just very quickly um, and say there are a lot of cost savings that we've seen by implementing GIS. But one other thing that we've noticed is that um, if we're doing a geospatial impact evaluation, lots of costs occur if um, there wasn't, for instance, program information collected geospatially um, at the time of implementation or when potentially um, if there was baseline data if it was collected then. Um, so one important thing to just think of as you move forward is that the cost of collecting GPS coordinates when um, implementation is taking place or baseline surveys taking place is extremely cheap, especially nowadays when on the ground data collection is being done with tablets, it's already built into the tablet. Um, that's just something that can be done up front to reduce cost later, even if you don't know if you're implemented. Um, and then I just wanted to talk about the kind of the measurement piece you're talking about. We've at ADATA seen something similarly. Um, for instance, we recently did um, uh, not so much an evaluation, but we um, interviewed uh, households, both men and women in households, about their agricultural plots and then walked um, the agricultural plots with GIS to try and um, see if we could find, like explain the measurement error that's gendered uh, using GIS measure. So, um, and uh, that's something that we've done. We were able to find, for instance, that um, men were misreporting uh, higher yields compared to women. And that was something we verified by using kind of an independent third observation. We also found very surprising things. For instance, if you ask a man and a woman about like the number of plots that they have, they agree like 70% of the time, but 30% of the time they don't even agree on how many plots they have. So, you know, we're investigating how that could be used, but I think it's a great like area of study that's like, you know, emerging and super interesting. Thank you. Um, anyone, so maybe on the, um, the, ev the use, right? We've been talking a lot about assessment, evaluation, exposed, impact evaluation, less so about um, operational use uh, about you know, giving feedback as the operation is ongoing. Um, anyone has insights uh, on, on how that can be embedded? I think a key part, of course, is, um, is to be able to, uh, to have, uh, you know, like in, in good adaptive management, the, I guess the, the foundation is, is having the, the feedback loop then in terms of what do you bring in terms of, of data, um, it's, very, it's very clear that um, um, there is some expertise that's needed. Whether or not this can be uh, done in every single case is probably a no, but if you have a particularly innovative project, uh, you know, bringing this expertise at key points during the design, during the implementation, is something that we would, I mean, really want to see more, and then also from an evaluation point of view, you know, this feedback that you were saying, um, that would make things much more meaningful in some way. Otherwise, it's a little bit of the, the one-off. Um, you brought the issue of the quality of data. I was wondering for, for our experts, perhaps Maya, you also can, can opine on that. Um, what are standards of quality in terms of you know, geospatial analysis, um, in terms of the, the data that we really need to, uh, to think about as, as we speak to non-experts, as we do this bridging process? What are some of the really key points in terms of standards, of quality, um, um, of uh, rigor that we need to, to have in mind and how, uh, you know, how different it, it is for geospatial versus other data, any reflections on, on quality and how we can enhance that so through triangulation or other things. Um, any final remarks on this or any of the other questions? And then we'll, we'll move for lunch and let Maya go to bed. <laughs> That's right. Thanks. Thanks, Esther. Yeah, so just very quickly, um, I, I think in terms of quality of geospatial data, uh, they're fairly good. Um, yeah, because, you know, you have you have the same type of data that's tracked across time, there's consistency. Uh, so in that sense, it, it's at least internally consistent. And I don't know about external validity, which I suppose you'll have to sort of cross-check with other sources of data, but by and large, I think they do a pretty good job of uh, representing reality. Any other, thank you, Maya. Any, yeah, Virginia, please. 
Yes, I just wanted to add a few points to, to that. And we approach data validation in different ways, and it depends in a way on, on the application and the model used. Some, some type of model, you can get a, a calculation of the accuracy of the model, and these are the, the category that we call supervised, which is when we already have labeled data. And we have the other big category of models which are unsupervised, which is more like the Dar es Salaam example that I showed, where we don't really have a ground truth to see to be able to tell with percentage accuracy uh, how successful the model was or not. So that's that's the first level, I think, on, on how we think about what we can measure about how well the data is working for measuring the, the, the reality that we want to observe. But regardless of on those cases, we normally approach a second stage of, of validation, and that can be done in, in different ways. Uh, one option is by uh, comparing for example, the maps that we produce with other uh, image uh, available. So for example, there is a high resolution um, satellite image that sometimes is publicly available, especially current one uh, from Google Earth, for example. So we can use to see if we see the, the same type of observations that our model predicted on specific areas. And another approach that we have taken as well is to consult with experts on the on the either the topic or on the specific location and to see whether the findings resonate well with, with them or not. And we use this feedback as well throughout the development of the model because we can sometimes incorporate this early on to, to refine our model. But I think that that additional check uh, can be can be important in order to to be confident that the results that we're presenting are are robust. Thank you. Maybe on the private sector side, the colleague from IFC in the back, I forgot your name. But maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, what what your team is up to, um, because it's true, Maria Lisa, we haven't seen many applications uh, in the private sector, at least uh, to my to my knowledge yet. Yep, um, Devanj from uh, IFC. Uh, in uh, ESG sustainable sustainability advice and solutions. And uh, we actually, uh, yes, we do have um, sort of uh, internal tools developed for um, risk assessment. And well, it, it's more from that point of view where it is, I see a lot of analysis being done here about um, post implementation sometimes and a lot of uh, sort of in project valuations. But uh, there is a lot of um, talk and use of uh, GIS tools in general um, for risk assessment is what we do for ESG sustainability. And um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll probably add later in a couple of other sessions of, I've already made notes, but Thank you. Uh, happy to also chat uh, more on this. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much for uh, for all your really great questions. We, we have about 55 minutes for lunch, break, going for a walk if it's still not raining. Um, and we will reconvene here and online at 1 p.m. Uh, DC time. Uh, looking forward to mingling with you and getting some food in the, in the corridor. And, and see you this afternoon. Thank you so much to our speakers for this morning.